good morning and welcome to the coast. Today we're going to pivot from our current teaching series, The Never Ending Story, and Brian is going to be talking about how God humbles the proud and exalts the humble in a teaching that he calls Christ-like humility. Hi guys. Good morning. It's great to see you. Uh, as you can tell, uh, Jerry's out today. We're praying for him. He's not feeling well. Um, the other thing is, sometimes that happens, and I have like a, a bunch of sermons on the ready. But you know, sometimes you, God wants you to speak on something. So I was up to like one thirty last night finishing this. So if this is all weird, he made me do it. So <laughs> anyway, um, let's go in prayer. Oh, Father, we we just come before you and just. Just in a, in a submission. We're just submitting to you, Lord, to your will, to your word. Let us learn more about you today. Let us be your children. Let us be what you would have us be. So in this moment, let us soften our hearts. Let us learn more about who we should be. In this time, this crazy time that we live in. It's your name we pray. Amen. So like I said, I had a number of things already kind of picked out. I could probably, you know, cookie cutter a sermon together. But I found I was driving home a couple of weeks ago and I was listening to, I think, Joy FM and they had a, an author on and he was talking about humility. And I bought the book after he was talking about it. It's a little itty bitty book. It's called Humbled by uh, David Mathis. Really quick, good read, but it was something that's been stuck on my heart since I read it. And it's been a couple of weeks, so despite what my wife was saying, just grab one of those, it's easier. Jerry just told you on Friday, you know, that kind of thing. I, I said, no, I'm going to go ahead and write something down because this is really what it is. Um, we're going to learn about Christ-like humility, what it means to be humble. Um, I think what we deal with right now, the current events of today have humbled us, I would say. You know, not only do we have the normal in day in and day out things that we go through that would keep us humble on a daily basis, but we have the pandemic, we have civil unrest, we have gender identity issues, we have just anything you can think of that would cause us to have just divisiveness and anger and hatred and things like that. So on top of all the external, we have the internal things too that will keep us down, keep us humbled, if we will. Loss of a loved one, loss of a job or career, relationship struggles, divorce, mental health issues, anxiety, depression, terrible accidents, exposure to personal sin, whether it's sexual, financial, or substance abuse, or something else that might embarrass us. But for most of us, the humbling of nations through novel viruses, civil unrest, threats of insurrection pales in comparison to the humbling circumstances that often devastate our own lives on a daily basis. We might watch the news, but we don't feel the news necessarily sometimes. But we do feel the break, the brokenness from divorce, the brokenness from losing a job and not worrying, not knowing how you're going to make ends meet, being a, a father or, or a mother that is raising kids and you don't know what it's going to look like for them. So I would say our most earth-shattering humblings are often known only by friends and family. So it really does come into consideration when you say, well, I, I might not be going through something, but I know someone who is, you know, someone that you can be there for and have love for them, right? So corrective words by a close friend or spouse can also put you in check or back on track, as it were. Even if it's done graciously, it's still something that will keep us at a level of keeping us humble. Or maybe a daily devotion time with God. Maybe his word has awakened something in you. You read something and said, oh, that's me. I'm supposed to read this today on purpose. There's something I need to change here. Have you ever found that God himself, through his word and or the power of the spirit, not only gives you spiritual life by feeding our souls, but also exposes that internal struggle that you're going through, that cancer of sin that overtakes us? His word not only exposes it, but sometimes it, he painfully cuts through it, right? It wakes us up. It says in Hebrews, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 
and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who must, we must give account to. So our world is broken. We too as sinners are broken. It's only a matter of time, if you haven't gone through some sort of humility, that you will experience that soon. To live in this world is to be humbled. God's grace gives us breathing room in that moment. He could, due to his majesty and glory, he could undo us daily. But it is his grace and mercy that we experience more days of grace, more days of joy than we probably deserve. His humbling hand descends descends upon us, mostly without warning, and catches us off guard. We don't want it usually, and like Jesus, we probably would pray for that cup to be taken away from us, right? Lord, I I don't don't want to go through this right now. I don't want to go through this trial. But it's there in that moment that we kneel before him, our Father, kneeling before him just as in our own Gethsemane, that he does his genuine humbling work in us on his terms. That's the key point. It's his terms, not the terms we would choose. That is the part that many of us struggle with. It's his timing, not ours. I know that that's something I struggle with. And I know today, you know, I'm starting off kind of heavy with it, but, you know, this is something that's really hit me hard, so I'm going to lighten the mood a little. Tell you a story about my dad. You know, he's not here right now, so he can't stop me. But it is Father's Day, and I like to say to all the fathers, you know, amazing things for you. And if, uh, you know, you can just call your dad if you still can and give him, give him some love. But <laughs> I have a lesson of humility and of skateboarding. See, I lived in the right, I grew up in Port Orange, right down the road. And if you grew up in the 80s like we did, skateboarding was the new thing. Everybody had skateboards, and I had this big Nash skateboard. It was green, and it was like this wide. It was huge. It was horrible. But I remember it specifically because it had this blue dragon on it, and I thought it was cool as anything. But all the kids in the neighborhood would play outside, right? That was the thing. Your mom said, don't come home until the lights come on outside. We don't even want to see you. Figure out lunch on your own. We literally used to mow lawns just to get food sometimes, yeah, just because we didn't want to go home. And so we're skateboarding. And I had the house that had the, the hill on the driveway. So if you know anything, if any of you had the house with the hill, you know that everybody came to your house. And your parents hated it because they thought, well, we might get sued, you know, but it was awesome. We would all go to the top of the hill, ride our skateboards into the grass, fall over, hit the fence, that kind of thing. And my dad always thought he might be like the cool dad. He thought he was. But, you know, he would, he would be outside gardening, doing whatever, uh, mowing the lawn. And he would say, you kids don't know how to skateboard. Because apparently in the 70s or something, they had these like little banana skateboards that he was always talking about, about the size of his foot. If any of you know, that, that's, he goes, this is how you skateboard. And so he grabs my skateboard. By the time he puts one foot on it, just imagine, my dad never wore a shirt. He's always doing lawn work. So he's a Florida boy, no shoes. I'll show you. He puts one foot on the board, and like out of the movie uh, Christmas Vacation, he just flies down that hill, hits the grass, launches himself about six feet, hits the fence. You know, I mean, we're like thinking he broke his nose, you know, the whole bit, and we're like, lesson in humility. Here's dad thinking, I'm going to show you kids how to do it. And mind you, there's 15 of us kids all doing this. <laughs> You gonna show us all, huh, old man? So that's my cool dad story, lesson in humility. He probably hates that story, but I think it's funny as ever. I tell it when anytime I can. <laughs> but back to humility, back to uh, what the Bible has to say. Let's, let's think. The first example that we might find in the Bible would be the showdown between Egypt's Pharaoh and Israel's God, Yahweh. Of course, it's mediated through Moses, right? The story shows God's might and power and the plagues placed on Egypt before the eighth plague. God asked, How long? Will you refuse to humble yourself before me? So we we'll dive into that a little bit and kind of get a better picture around it. A lot of times pastors, I think, will start off a story like this and they might say, well, everyone knows the story. And I don't like to assume everyone knows the story, so I'm going to give you a little background. I think uh, the let my people go bit might clue you into what we're talking about. But Moses' story is pretty well known. Um, he was tasked by God to speak to Pharaoh on his behalf and demand that the Israelites who were kept in captivity at the time, slaves for quite a long time, they were, he, he asked them to get his people freed, right? Go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. The captivity in the kingdom of Egypt, you know, this is a, a pretty well-known thing. He, uh, for 400 years, had them captive. And so this is the only life they knew. Pharaoh, with a hardened heart and full of pride, 
After all, he was considered a god among his people, so he is full of pride, refused to lose out on this free labor force and would not let these people go. And the story goes that God sent plague after plague to the land of Egypt so that the world would see these signs, see the power of the true God, and ultimately come to know him. But the king of Egypt's pride was immense, and plague after plague, it continued. The river of blood was first, and frogs, and gnats, flies, livestock, boils, hail. But just before the locusts came, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron to go forewarn Pharaoh that if God's people were not freed, a plague of locusts would come and consume the land. What is interesting here is that the Lord had Moses and Aaron ask Pharaoh first. This is the phrase I was after. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Now, mind you, the countryside is just devastated, all these different plagues. And it's kind of like God saying, man, this is a stubborn man. How long are you going to let this go on? Even his people, even his advisors, Pharaoh, come on, let these people go. This is getting bad. How long will you let yourself refuse to humble yourself? Pharaoh refuses to acknowledge his proper place in the created order by asserting that he is sovereign over the land, not the Lord. The purpose of the plagues is so that Pharaoh may know that Yahweh is Lord. This was done not just for Egypt, but also done for Israel to witness the might of the Lord and acknowledge him as the true God. So we kind of get an introduction into the heart of humility. Humility acknowledges and obeys the one who is truly God. So we'd like to say there's two required views for this. It requires a correct view of oneself as a creature created by God and accountable to God, and it requires a correct view of God, the creator, the one with authority over his creation. Humility, therefore, is not for us to be preoccupied with ourselves and how we can become low and humble down. That's missing the point. It is for us to be mindful and conscious of God that in our recognition of who he is and willingness to submit to his authority, we can become humbled. We acknowledge that we are not all that he is. We are not God. It is conscious of self only in respect to God. Humility is the act of embracing the reality of this phrase, I am not God. I don't control everything. It is a posture of soul and body and life that acknowledges and obeys the one who is truly God. So here, here's where we have our struggle. Here's where I have my struggle. When your next trial comes, and it will, the next trial is right around the corner, maybe today, how, what's your response? Will you humble yourself? Do you know how to humble yourself? There's a moment of choice that we all have faced or will face again and again where we're going to have to ask ourselves that question, when that next trial comes, am I going to bow up and be full of pride? Or am I going to bow down in humility before my creator, my maker, my redeemer, my friend, my father? How will you respond to God's humbling purposes in that trial? And that's something we need to change our, set, our mindset on as well, is that it's God's humbling purposes that I'm going through something. You might not like it. Most of the time, we're not going to like it. We don't want it. But our response is that he is the true God. He is good. He is just. And if we don't know that about him, then maybe we need to start there in our relationship with the Lord. God has a promise for you in these moments that the God of all power will exalt the humble in his perfect timing. So how do I humble myself? Scripture forces us to ask this question, and we're commanded to seek humility. Humility. Zephaniah 2, 3 says, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. Colossians 3, 2. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. While this is a biblical directive, it is not something that we can just up and do by ourselves. God initiates this. He's the one in control. 
I know us as Americans, we like to think that, well, just give me the directions, I'll figure it out. And then even as some of us dads, we get directions, we're like, I don't need the directions, I'm just going to do it, right? And then you end up with extra parts and pieces, right? At least that's what's happened to me in the past. <laughs> we're not the drivers of our own humility. Our God designs the humbling way in which he crafts the virtue of humility in us. Let me say that again. Our God, the creator, designs the humbling way in which he crafts the virtue of humility in us. It is his work in us. He takes the initiative. He moves first. It is his actions. Our humility happens on his terms. He knows what's going on. He moves with sovereign, omnipotent, meticulous care. It is his plan. So your relationship with God at this point, at the moment of choice, when your trial face, comes to face-to-face -to -face with your trial, your relationship with God is key. What do you know of him? What do you know of your God? That in this trial, is he there for you? Can you trust in him? So much so, so, much so that in the midst of tragedy, you're going to trust in his goodness, trust in his might, and his parental unconditional love. So ask yourself that question. Are you going to humble yourself and embrace God's humbling hand? Or are you going to try to fight back? Make this about you, and I'll be able to handle this. Receive his humbling experiences or try to explain them away. Soften your heart to him or harden with pride. The truth self-humbling is not our initiative, but it does require our doing as we learn to welcome the uncomfortable work of God. So just as I say it's his plan, his initiative, it still requires work on our end. We need to be ready. We need to get ourselves in a stature, uh, in a posture of humility. God has given means of grace to pursue and build out our habits to grow in relationship with him so that when his humbling hand does descend again, and it will, we might be ready to receive it as what it is. Embrace him in faith. Trust him as a good and just father and genuinely humble ourselves in response to this uncomfortable work that is at place. So I'm diving further into what the Bible has to say about it, and what we're going to look at it are two apostles that have stated the call for us to be humble. We're going to look at James, and we're going to look at Peter. They're going to call us to be humble. We're in both, quote, the Greek translations of Proverbs 3.34. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, and we're going to dive into a little context here so we just understand that we're not looking at that phrase. We want to understand what was going on in those times when they made this statement, when they were speaking to the early church. So we're going to be in James 4 for just a moment. And we're going to see that these, this you know, is a response to the trial that was at hand at that time. So we're going to talk about that this trial comes from within within the church. We see that this call to self-humbling come along as a response to trials facing the early church. Specifically, he is referring to fights and quarreling within the church itself. Let's read uh, James 4, 1 through 8. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight, and you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means an enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has called to dwell in us? but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This conflict between those who claim the name of Christ, it humbles the church. It in itself is a test of pride and of humility. James reminds the fighting brothers and sisters in Christ that they are in fact sinners and double-minded. He even reminds them of the divine promise of Proverbs 3.34 that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He charges the church here to submit to God and resist the devil and draw near to the Lord. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Here the church is being humbled from within. But what is the church humbled from without? 
First Peter, we're going to see this story. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory in God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if hard, if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Here we see that the church is under external pressure, extreme external pressure. These early Christians are victims to discrimination, insults, and threats. They're beginning to suffer both emotionally, physically, socially. It was in this social strife environment that Peter exhorts them, and just as James did, he refers to the divine promise of 334. Peter 5, 5, and 6 says, In the same way that you are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you in due time. The humbling is coming from without. How will the early church respond to God's humbling purposes in these insults and hardships? Will they humble themselves? Do they respond with prideful actions and self-exaltation, or will they bow down to the humbling hand of the Lord? So we've seen what some of the apostles have to say about it. Now, there's also something that we can do for ourselves, which is self-humility. Self-humbling is not something we initiate, again. It is something we receive. It's something we embrace and welcome when God does his humbling work in us. God gets our attention with disruption. (laughs) Sometimes we really notice that disruption. Whether direct or indirect, God initiates. Then he invites us to engage in his mercy and embrace it, however severe or painful it may be. Again, the purposes are his and his alone, yet we have seen in Scripture many times the purpose is for us to know him better, to understand that he is the creator and we are not, that we are to trust him when he says he loves us and craves to be with us. Again, humility is not an achievement, just like faith is not an achievement. Humility is not human initiative, but rather a God-given response in us to God himself and his glory and his purposes in the world and in our lives. We cannot teach ourselves to be humble. There's no infomercial. There's no 10-step program with some crazy physical trainer that's all buff. However, we can take steps to draw near to God. That's something we can do. To know him in a more personal sense, to gain perspective on who he is so that we create and cultivate a posture of humility that will come into play when that next trial comes around the corner. When we're confronted, accosted, slapped in the face with reality of a harsh, broken world, and we find ourselves grasping to whatever control we thought we might have had, then the question comes in again, how are you going to respond to this new challenge? How are you going to respond to this new trial, and will you humble yourself? Self-humbling is responsive. The truth of it is, that we don't initiate humility and we don't get the credit for it either. It is responsive to who God is, what he has said to us through his word that he is doing in the world, of what he is doing in the world. Responsive to all the inconvenience, pain, disappointment we experience in our own lives. Self-humbling is just receiving God's person, words, acts when he is doing, when acts when he is doing so it's not easy or comfortable Self-humbling in an essence when, is when, where we jump into the deep end of discomfort on purpose. Disruption from hand, God's hand and plan that humbles us. And two, that the moment of choice where we once again face with that question, will I receive God's humbling or am I going to resist it? So remember that as we saw in the case of Pharaoh, eventually you will have to answer this question. 
God's not going to hide who he is from us. He will make himself known. If we do not humble ourselves, then further divine humbling circumstances will follow in time. Realization is that God's initial humbling could lead to further humbling. The question we're faced with is whether it's going to be self-humbling or further divine humbling. I would say the divine humbling is a little more severe at times. So we can cultivate that posture of humility in preparation for the trials to come, essentially an acknowledgement of who he is, daily humbling ourselves under the authority of God's word by obeying his word and seeking him, drawing near to him in relationship through prayer, through fasting, and cultivating this posture as creatures submitting to the creator. We resolve that humbling ourselves is a response to who God is. So will you try to explain it away? Are you going to push back against it or let it lead you to genuine repentance? So how can we get this in our lives? What can we do? What, what can we do to prepare ourselves and create or cultivate that posture? We can repent, acknowledge the sin in your life and turn from it. Acknowledge that sin in your life and go to God and say, I know you can handle this, but I can't. Acknowledge, declare him right in all things, understanding his attributes that he is a good and just God. Learn from others' humbling experiences. This is a good one. This is the older brother illustration that I would say. My older brother did a lot of crazy things. I don't know about any of you, if you have an older sibling, it was easier for me to go into school or any kind of function because I'm like, well, I saw my brother mess up many, many times, and I know what not to do. It happened so much that I think the teachers would, because I was just a year behind my brother Mike, I would go to the same teachers and sit in class and they'd get to the you know, roll call and they'd go, Lily, are you Mike's brother? I'm already in trouble. I didn't do anything. Yeah. So learn from others' humbling experiences. Come away from that a little bit uh, ahead of the game if you can. If you see someone going through it, or, or even better, if someone has gone through it, that's wisdom. Listen to them when they talk. Find someone that's gone through that experience. This is a good one, too. Think less of yourself. We're taught, in, at least in our culture, that, you know, there's a whole bunch of pride stuff going on. And I'm not just talking about that it's Pride Month or anything like that. I'm just saying there's pride everywhere. Anything you do, I know that when I was growing up, my mom said, don't, you don't take nothing from nobody. Okay, what does that mean, Mom? I'm like, that puts me already in a state pride. I'm better than this. I'm, I'm higher than this. You can't talk to me this way. And, you know, submitting, what is that? Who's going to know what that is? At least that's what we were taught. But God's saying, think less of yourself. Romans 12, 3 says, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Man, think less of yourself, guys. Remember, we live in a self-indulgent world where entitlement and self reign supreme. Choose the lowest place. Luke 14, 10 and 11 says, but when you're invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all of the other guests. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Secure yourself. Secure yourself to Christ. We should strive to be secure enough in Christ that we are okay when qualities go unacknowledged. Let that pride go. Let God shine. Let Jesus shine in your life, allowing us to go, let go of pride and embrace that humble stature. That's what we can do to prepare for this. God himself, fully divine and fully human in the person of his son, he humbled himself. You want the best example I can give you? It's going to be Christ. Often we might be asked, is God humble? Now see, this is a tricky question, right? Is God humble? See, God is not arrogant or prideful. He is not the opposite of what we understand humility to be. Humility is a creaturely virtue, which is a weird word, creaturely virtue. And God, the creator, he's not a creature. He's the creator. However, 
so that we understand that our God, our God understands us and wants to know more about us and have relationship with us and relate to us. He sent God, the man, Jesus, to experience that very same humility, that creature humility. He experienced that which we experienced to leave us an example. He humbled himself. Christ humbled himself is not a statement we should take lightly. We should marvel and reflect on what this means. Paul teaches us that the eternal son first became man, a servant, to relate with his creatures, and then humbled himself. And only Paul phrased it in a more revealing manner, stating that he emptied himself. Philippians 2, 6, 7 says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality, Equality with God, something to be used of his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in a human likeness. He emptied of himself. Jesus humbled himself through obedience. Obedience, he humbled himself so much so in obedience that it was to the point of death, even death on the cross. Being humbled is to acknowledge God as Lord and to obey as a servant, as Jesus did. Genuine obedience endures. He did not begin his obedience and after a time flip-flop and say, all right, I've had enough of that. That got really tough, so I'm just going to go ahead and not obey Christ anymore, not obey God anymore. No, he endured in his obedience, the ultimate obedience, all the way and to the point of death. This acknowledging and obeying his very own father's words and will all the way to the point of torture, ridicule, death on the cross, this, this is how Paul builds up the remarkable claim that he humbled himself. We don't take that lightly. The humility of Christ is true humility. It is not denigrating of humanity, but it's God's image shining in its fullness. To humble ourselves is to come closer to God, which each trial, step by step, we come closer to this bliss and full favor for which we were made. If we truly know the magnitude of our God, we can fulfill our purpose of worshiping him to the fullest degree. He initiates this humbling of his creatures. Will you receive it? Will you humble yourself in response to his humbling hand? He experiences this, his own command, so that we know that we're not alone. We can go through this trial with him, with his strength. He exalts the humble in his time and plan. His humbling hand is not painless. And I'm not here to give you any great news about that, but he is a great, magnificent God that can handle anything that we put his way. And in his strength, we can come through the trial. We learn to welcome his sometimes uncomfortable work. Philippians 2.9 says he exalts us to the highest. Therefore God exalted to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That's what we should be seeking. So your challenge today, God commands us to be humble. Jesus, Jesus promises that God will exalt the humble, invites us to seek this humility. And even his apostles, James and Peter, provide us guidance to humble yourselves. Are you going to prepare yourself are you going to cultivate that posture of humility? Will you answer the call to be obedient and submit to the authority of God in this area of your life? Will you humble yourself? Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for teaching us hard lessons. Thank you for being a God that's good and just. That in moments that we don't know the answers, we don't know how to get through this Thing we're facing, whether it's something national, whether it's something so personal that only our friends and family know. God, we cling to you. We want to draw near to you. We want to know you better so that we understand that you are good and just. And what we're going through, we're going to humble ourselves. We're going to say, I am not God, but I need my God. I'm going to trust in Jesus' promises and wait for the exalting that only you can give. So today, let us walk away from the hardened heart. Let's soften our hearts some. Let's open ourselves and trust you more. 
that in those moments, when the trial hits, that we can say wholeheartedly that we trust in you and we can humble ourselves before you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Sometimes I wonder if he's faithful. Does he see me in my trouble? Does he understand? Sometimes I question if he's able. Can he rescue? Can he save me again and again? But when I Sometimes those voices try to tell me I've forgotten and I've fallen too far from his hands. But I know what kind of God he is. I'm trusting in his promises and believing. I'm singing, yes, he can. Did he move every mountain? Yes, he can. Did he defeat the darkness? Did he deliver me? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Oh, yes, he can. You seem too much now. Can't deny he's come through every single. Yes, he did. So yes, he.